We're playing the game here, but okay, the let's play maybe is I don't know what opening should we play. What opening we will play here? Maybe Scandinavian? Okay, let's play Scandinavian opening, but okay. Because we oh E5. <laughs> okay, so E5 is already bad. This is already a mistake. Why? Why is it a mistake? Because if you compare this to a French, like think about it logically, a French would arise if we were to play e6 here and then white were to play d4, that would be a French advance. Okay, but what is the main drawback of the French other than the fact that it sucks? It's the fact that the dark, the, why does it suck? It's the fact that the light squared bishop, apologies to French players, the light squared bishop is behind bars. So let's make sure that it's not behind bars and then the French is gonna be awesome. Right, imagine if in the French you could jump out to f5. This is literally a French advance, except the bishop is on f5. But then you might think, well, what about the Karokan? Isn't the Karokan th this? Well, the Karokan isn't quite this, because in the Karokan you have this position with a loss of tempo. If we were to play c6 here, that would be a Karokan. But we have the best of all worlds here, because we don't need to play c6. We can now play c5 in one fell swoop. Does that make sense? Now we can play c5 in one fell swoop. a3 is kind of a waste of time. Exactly. I mean, I think we should we should cancel the French. Also, I lost a bunch of games there, so I'm very sour grapes about it. Okay, so c3, obviously. Let's let's develop our knight. Um, yeah, knight c6. Uh, Fabby beat. Let me just make a cold run. Dying of heat right now. One sec. He is wasting his time. What is he doing here? What is he doing here? Thank you, Tony Lasagna. Okay, stop being annoying. All right, what should we do, guys? French players, I give you the floor. French players, I give you the floor. What's normal here? How do we put pressure on the pawn? Pressure. And so on. Pressure and so on and so on. But we don't take. Why would We don't want to take. And I will explain after the game why. We don't want to take yet, because the drawback of taking is that it allows this knight on b1 a natural developing square on c3. One of the, the good things about this pawn chain, why do we want white to keep it? Because as long as white keeps it, this knight will have a very hard time developing. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, I get that, but doesn't queen b6 allow him to take the pawn on c5? Well, it does, but that breaks up the pawn chain. We take with the bishop, we attack f2, we attack e5, that's totally good for us. At least for the time being. So you should only take on d4 when there's a very tangible benefit to doing so, such as when you're winning that pawn or you have something going down the c-file. You shouldn't take unless you absolutely have to or unless you gain something very specific from it. Now, we have a very cool idea here. And that idea does involve, it's not the best move, but I'm gonna play it because it's really cool. It does involve taking on d4. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a minute to spot this idea. It's not particularly amazing. What I will say is that it wins a pawn. It wins a pawn and it's really pretty. And then after the game, I'll explain my logical thought process. Who can spot this idea? It's really tough. Now, the, the idea doesn't work if he takes with the, with, with the knight, but that's good for us anyway. Okay, let me take. Now, I'm hoping he takes with a pawn so I'm able to demonstrate the idea, yes. Oh my God, strange quirk, you deserve a sub, wow. A lot of you are finding it, that's really cool. Tobias Crowd found it as well, and Artie Beer, you take the knight, and what are we doing? And now you take the pawn on a3 at the very end of it, and what's great about this is that this bishop now will be able to return to b4 with an extremely nasty check. If he takes, we take on b1. What do you have to check for there? You have to check for discovered checks, but he has none because our king is on a light square. That bishop is a dark squared bishop. All right. That's a cool, cool idea. This might be the computer's best chance. I mean, I actually think it's it's probably the best the best move. That's a that's a, a five head idea. 
And I'll show you guys a game I played many, many years ago where I set a very similar kind of trap. That's when I learned about this type of idea. I was 1800 at the time. I mean, while he's thinking, I'm gonna pull up the game. Right, exactly, Brandon. But Brandon, give me, give me the fact that this was cool. <laughs> this was a very nice idea. This is a legitimately nice idea, I think. Okay. So, bishop d3. Now, obviously, he is reinforcing now the threat of b takes a3. I have one important piece of advice to share in this general area. When a piece is defended tactically, such as a bishop that's on a3, a lot of people, what they'll do is they will leave the bishop on a3. That's a very common source of a blunder. If you're defending a piece indirectly, and that piece is technically hanging, make sure on every move that you either remove the piece from that square, or if you leave it there, make sure that your opponent isn't you know, creating the threat of taking it. So in this position, for example, he's defending the rook with his bishop, which is why we have to do something with our bishop. Bishop b4, bishop d2. Now, taking on d4 would be a blunder. Taking on d4 would be a blunder because he would recapture on d4, and after queen takes d4, he would give us this very typical check on a4, forking the king of the bishop. Also, we don't want to do that anyway because we're not developed. So what should we do? Should we take his bishop and then take the pawn? Is that fine? Can we do that? Can we take his bishop and take the pawn? Artie Beer, you're absolutely right. But I want somebody to tell me why we can't do that. No, we can't. Again, typical if you've played the French, knight takes, queen takes, and he has the discovery on b5, bishop b5 check. So... There's really no need to take his bishop. He's not threatening to take our bishop. Let's just develop our pieces. There is knight h6 and knight e7. Let's develop a little bit closer to the center. Knight h6 is fine, but this gives the knight more options. Maybe we'll want to go to g6 to avoid a Greek gift sacrifice, for example. Also, knight f5 would be very nice, but he has a bishop here, so that's probably going to be unlikely. And in fact, that uh, spiel about avoiding the Greek gift sacrifice, that's a must. If we were to castle here, we would allow a Greek gift sacrifice and it would work. So we can take on d2 and get his queen to reposition, but I don't, well, you know what? I reconsider. Let's take his bishop. Let's take his bishop first. And, and not because I want to avoid the Greek gift sacrifice. That's not the primary reason. Um, and I'll explain the primary reason after the game because we're a little bit short of time. Now, what can we do now? What can we do now? Now, if we go knight f5, we allow bishop takes f5. That cripples our pawn structure. But doesn't castle allow a Greek gift sacrifice? Doesn't castle allow a Greek gift sacrifice? What has changed? Now, of course, I've given you guys the hint that it doesn't. But why? Why doesn't it allow the Greek gift? Because the queen can't get to h4. And not only can it not get to h5, it can't get to h4 either. Sometimes in the Greek gift... A queen can start off on h4, on, on f4, and then it can go to h4, fulfilling the same exact role. But here, the queen can't get to the h file. So these small little things, you know, at this rating, at 1600, he, oh, his first name's Dewa, Monk Ayas, I just noticed that. Um, that's not good. Maybe I should have played a little bit faster, faster. But, lol. Damn, yeah, he's playing pretty well, like I was saying. Simon, <laughs> I think maybe like 15 or 20 I'd have a chance against the 15, 1600 struggling turtle thing for the prime. So again, we, we can't take on d4 still. This time he doesn't have bishop b5, but he has bishop takes h7, in effect the same kind of tactic. So a lot of people at this point would consider king h8, but I don't love that move. I don't think that's the best way to reinforce the threat of knight takes d4. What I like doing is repositioning this knight to g6. This puts something more solid um, in terms of blocking the bishop, and I just kind of like the knight here. It can come to f4 if the queen moves. This knight has a lot of potential energy, not kinetic energy. It's not doing anything right now other than blocking the bishop, but it's got a lot of potential energy. And I love that you guys are suggesting rook c8. That could very well be our next move. First of all, this is now a threat, which he has to deal with. <laughs> come on. I thought you were more merciful than that, Simon. What is, what's wrong with you? <laughs> okay. 
So I know I, I'm not trolling, guys. This is a phenomenal move. This is a phenomenal move because after knight takes d4, knight takes d4, queen takes d4, but I think I outcalculated him. What's his idea? What is his idea at the end of that line? He wants to go h5. Okay, why is that good? Because if we move our knight, then he's going to have bishop takes h7 check. But let's not despair. If we look at that position very, very carefully, after knight, knight d4, knight d4, queen d4, h5. Could anybody spot a resource that black has using that knight on g6 to do something very interesting? No, we don't want to go h5. We can take. We can take. But after h5 in that final position, a very difficult move is available to us. And that is queen f4. We can move our queen using the knight as the defender, repositioning our queen, offering a queen shoot. And if he moves his queen, then we can move our knight. If I've calculated this correctly, we have four. Now, he can play rook c queen c2, which builds a little battery against h7. Now, that's not that scary. We can take on e5. But in addition, as you're indicating, we can go right rook ac. The reason we don't go knight f4 is because it blunders the queen. Knight f4, bishop h7, and queen takes d4. And if you think, ah, well, I can fork him in the end, remember, he's got a rook on e1 defending e2. I think some, some of you might have missed that. Unconventional the 15 months. Thank you. That's a nice move. Is the knight not trapped in the end? No, we've got e7 and e5. We've got we've got plenty of squares. No, no problem. My opponent is playing very well, though. He's, his calculation has been excellent. We've just outcalculated him a little bit. But I've been playing really good chess myself, I think. Our, our accuracy in this game, if we can keep this going, is going to be good. It, it has to be Dawa keep us. Exactly. Okay, guys. If it's on f4, the reason the knight isn't trapped is because we're attacking the bishop and the pawn on h5. And we can carve out a square for the knight. You know, he can go d4, worse comes to worse, and reposition the knight on d5. He does go queen to c2. Now, which rook do we want to get to c8? Let's consider that question. We want to go rook fc8. We want to make an intermediate move. Which way should we go? Both rooks are fine, I would say. But I like the concept of this rook being a protector of the king I roll. I don't really want to go with the f rook, not because there's anything inherently wrong with it, because I'm a little bit worried about leaving my king uh, kind of open like this, if that makes sense. So it's more of an intuitive choice. It's more of an intuitive choice. That the, the benefit of going rook fc8 would have been that if he goes queen b3 and then takes this pawn, the pawn on a7 will be protected. Here, the pawn is not protected. Queen e2 is correct. We've got to move our knight back. I'm kind of regretting this, though. We could have taken the pawn on e5. I think I should have done that. Knight takes e5, bishop takes h7, king h8. That was essential. I honestly hoped he wouldn't play queen e2, but this is still good for us. Now we're two pawns up. Black is winning. We just got to consolidate, make sure he doesn't whip up any counterplay. He's probably going to go here, would be my guess, um, if I had to guess. I've never guessed a move, though, before, or anything for that matter. God of chess. Well, he's playing like one. Okay. Yeah, so Gaines is absolutely right. We got to drop our queen back. Why did I go queen g5? Why didn't I go queen d4? Because queen d4 would have walked into what nasty little move. Could somebody explain to me why I didn't go queen d4 here? Why choose g5? Because queen d4 would have walked into... Either queen d2, but more so rook b to d1. Rook b to d1, centralizing his rook. And again, I don't want anything to do with these discovered attacks and discovered checks. So b4. Now, mental note, whenever a pawn is pushed like this, take five seconds and determine which squares have been weakened as a consequence. And in this particular position, we can occupy that square immediately, immediately, as Walter Brown used to say. Immediately, we can roll rook to c3, sinking the rook into that square, making contact with the bishop, potentially preparing to double the rooks. The knight can come out to f5. Again, you can see how much potential energy our pieces are having. But we got to act pretty fast. Okay, at b5. So one thing to note, he might want to play rook a1, and then we will have a hard time defending this pawn. So I think we don't necessarily have time to double rooks. I think we need to go very directly for a kingside attack. So what, what, is that in, what does that entail? What move does that entail? 
Yeah, I did play Walter. Unfortunately, he passed away, but I had the honor of playing him. Yeah, let's go knight f5. Let's get, get the knight involved. Now, he can trade, but that's good for us. That simplifies the position and we're two pawns up. And after queen takes f5, we then could reposition the rook to c2. Second rank equals good. If he doesn't do anything, rook to b4, wow, that's a really... That's a good looking move, but it isn't actually good, to my understanding. Because we have a little bit of a tactic now. As Artie Beer, man, you're sharp today. Knight takes g3 is absolutely right. Absolutely right. And after f takes g3, some genius put their rook on c3. And after queen takes g3, we check the king and fork the rook. We're four pawns up there and we win back the bishop. Now, I guess he wants to play queen g4, but then we trade queens. We're three pawns up and they're completely winning endgame. Not to toot my own horn, but if we can keep this going well, I want to check my accuracy in this game. Now, start thinking about queen g4. Start asking yourself if you have to take the queen or might there be ways to win the game even faster after queen g4. Just as a quick, you know, just to keep everybody tactically involved. Queen g4, do you have to take the queen? Can anybody spot an alternative? Artie Beer, I feel like you're in a tactical role. You'll spot this move. Nice, prime suspect sees it. Queen to d2, loose pieces drop off. We can move the queen to d2, attack the rook, and his threats against our king are non-existent. h6 may look scary, but we can always meet that with g6, if that makes sense. The accuracy will be higher than the internet speed. I don't know. I don't know if anything's possible. If anything could be higher than the internet speed, but, oh, but it doesn't quite work. I just noticed something myself. After queen g4, queen to d2, and this is really complicated, he's got rook to d1 attacking the queen. I'll show that after the game. He doesn't do it. Queen takes g3, and this is going to be pretty straightforward. Okay, queen g2, what do we do? Do we take the queen and take the bishop? Even though we've got a minute, you can take 5, 10 seconds and make sure you find the most accurate continuation because that'll pay itself off. If you do find the most accurate continuation, looking, not no tunnel version here. You notice the rook is hanging, nice. And now, of course, we check to make sure there's no mate threats there. Okay, is there anything there? No, there isn't. We can very safely take the bishop. Also notice that this pawn hangs with check, as does this rook. So if he goes rook to g4 here, it's not too late to blunder. g6 would have been a pretty big mistake. Now, before I take on e5 and win, to unlock that, who can tell me why g6, h, g, h, g? That's the fatal mistake. Oh, not a fatal mistake, it's a draw. Why is that a big mistake? If we go g6 and then takes and take back. He's got perpetual. He can sack the remaining rook, fg, and a very typical perpetual, right? Queen h6, queen g6. I'm sure everybody's seen that before. So we take the pawn, we defend the other pawn, and we check the king. The game is over. Either he has to get checkmated, basically, or he has to trade, you know, allow the trade of everything. So rook d1 check, of course, forcing him to give up his queen. And again, we can take the queen, but take five seconds here. Find the most accurate move. Don't let him breathe. Don't let him, you know, don't let him flag you. Boom. Queen takes h5. And queen takes g4. And the game is over. Absolute giga chad. Yeah. Take the queen. And we don't have mate in one, but we do have, I'm trying to find mate in two here. Check, we can give mate in three. And who sees the mate? Who sees the mate before my time runs out? It's queen g3. Yeah. Okay, nice, queen g3. All right, let's check the accuracy. I feel like this is the one time I do want to flex. This was a really nice game. I'm pumped. Drum roll, please. And yeah, 95.5. That was okay. That was, I was hoping for, for 97 or 98, but it's fine. Um, it'll do. Okay. That's lower than the internet speed. That's right about the internet speed if you add a zero. <laughs> okay, so we tried to play a Scandi and failed. He goes E5. And of course, bishop f5 leads to basically an improved French. Um, so d4, e6. Again, comparison is a very good way to understand these kinds of positions. So compared to a Karakhan, you know, basically it's the same position. 
But we have a pawn on e6 and a pawn on c7. So we have an ideal version of the French. Except it doesn't suck. Now, a3 is a weird move. I don't know why he did this. a3, c3, h3. He's wasting a lot of time making pawn moves and giving us the ideal setup. Wait, wv. Um, I hope you're I hope you're sarcastic. I wasn't didn't actually mean any disrespect to my opponent. I didn't mean to like slow roll him. Okay, so queen b6, and he goes knight f3. And now, of course, we win the pawn. Now, how did I see this? Well, there's no easy answer here. Because to be completely honest with you guys, it's my pattern recognition that kicked in here. But as I was doing this, I remembered a game that I played many, many years ago where I did something pretty similar. And that game has sort of stuck with me because it's a similar type of idea. If I may show you that segment from the prehistoric era from the absolute prehistoric era so yeah this um this was the k through four nationals in fourth grade and um i was 1900 and i used to i played the night off then well of course com compared uh this was in houston so in this position we have a typical night or i was playing a very underrated player and we get this position, right? And, okay. So the moment he played rook c1, two things occurred to me. At first, I was like, man, this is bad. This is bad because the rook is x-raying the queen. But x-rays work both ways. The other thing to notice here is that the queen on f2, it might not seem significant, but his back rank is weak here, right? His king has no escape to the second rank. So I found an idea that was really nice, and he fell right into it. I go rook f to c8. This appears to be a very pointless move because, of course, well, I am technically attacking his pawn, but he can just kick my bishop away with b3, and then why did I put the rook on c8? It's just staring at the pawn that's well defended. What did he miss? And this is a nice concept. Malcolm, very nice. Bishop takes b3. And after c takes b3, what's the follow-up? Yep. Yep. Exactly. You take one rook, then you take the other rook, and it's not checkmate. The queen has to block, but when you tally up, um, when you tally up the scores here, black is up in exchange and a pawn. So, this is the kind of idea that that occurred in this game, right? Using the fact that a piece is undefended or poorly defended, and then particularly taking the pawn with a bishop. So it's a sort of pin. Right, it's not exactly a pin, but it, is, it really is a pin. The reason a lot of people, I think, miss this is because when we see a rook x-raying the queen, we just assume that it's good for the rook, that the queen is the one which is going to be in trouble, but that's not necessarily the case. Pins go both ways. You know, the rook is, is x-raying the queen, but the queen is also x-raying the rook. And in this case, black holds all of the cards because white can't get rid of his pawn, even if he wants to, whereas black can be the one to exploit the fact that the pawn is, the pawn is here, if that makes sense. Thank you, the, uh, the Anuna, for the four months. Okay, so bishop takes a3. And so that kind of, um, that kind of led to this. I'm not saying it's deep at all. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's that deep. I just think it's, maybe a good way to understand how the pattern recognition comes into being. Um, okay. I'm just looking. Yeah, so if we didn't do this, what? how else could we develop our pieces? Well, we could play this very, very simple. We could play either rook c8 here, preemptively putting a rook here, just in case the file opens. We can play knight g to e7, and then you know get the knight to g6. And in the Karo Khan, you often drop the bishop back to g6 to get the knight to f5. So many different things we could do. You could also take the knight immediately and go knight g7, although I like this less. You can play bishop d3. So many things that could be done here as an alternative. All right. So, of course, uh, you would have to check that there's no discovery. As I said, bishop d3, bishop b4 check, bishop d2. Again, if we take... Then after takes, takes, queen a4 check, he wins He wins the bishop. Um, what if you played knight b4 instead of retreating the bishop? Now, knight b4 allows b takes a3. I know what you're trying to do here, but look more carefully. Queen takes d3, defends the rook. 
Wait, WV, can you can you uh, express for for all people replying? The stalemate in the position was very unrealistic. Also, he still had a pawn move. That being said, I feel like playing for a stalemate in a position where I'm twenty points down. Oh, you're saying he was disrespectful? No, no, no. It's I mean I think he was fine. Just for the record, as a quick detour, because I think this is a pertinent topic. I know what you're saying. I personally don't think it's that disrespectful to play until checkmate. I think what is disrespectful, one could argue, is taking all of your time in a position where you're down, you know, a bunch of pieces. But it's within your rights. If you want to make somebody prove it, then you can make somebody prove it. And I don't think people should necessarily take personal offense at that. I think it can be a little bit dirty. It can be a little bit annoying, but I wouldn't go so far as to call it disrespectful, if, if that makes sense. Not that I have a monopoly on what's respectful. It's not that's just my opinion. Okay. Yeah, letting the clock run out is very disrespectful. I agree. Doing it quickly if you're just playing and trying to lure your opponent into stalemating you, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I've people have done that against me, just like take up all their time. I remember when one tournament my brother was playing, and he was around 1900. And he was playing another 1900 and he was winning. And the guy was playing really quickly, so he had 50 minutes left at the end of the game, but he was totally lost. And he literally gets up on his own move, and he returns 25 minutes later, and he's got a hot dog. And he literally went to like a restaurant to get food during his move when he was three moves away from getting checkmated. So that's crossing the line, otherwise it's fine. Okay, so bishop d2, knight g to e7, he castles, which is good tactical recognition, again, this is a super typical situation. Bishop b5 wins the queen. Now, if you remember, Charlie against Irob once did something like this. Um, so he did it in the wrong order. You have to first take the knight, of course. Takes, takes, bishop b5. So we castle, rook fu1, and um, knight g6. Knight g6, uh, essentially uh, blocking away the bishop, right? Not allowing the bishop to to do any kind of shenanigans and reinforcing the threat of knight takes d4. h6 would also be possible, although it doesn't necessarily defend against the check on h7. And he goes h4, which is a mistake, although it's a pretty cool move. My brother is currently 2100, although he's retired from chess, but he's, yeah, 2090, I think you can look it up. Um, and what should white have done? I mean, he should have defended the pawn. He should have defended the pawn. And then we go rook ac yeah it's not bad rook ac8 um occupying the open file that's a great move knight b4 is fine black is just a pawn up okay so h4 knight takes d4 and um using the 15 second rule i think is a good way to spot queen f4 right in this position many people would look at this and say ah i'm losing right i can't move the knight the the line is over but take another 15, 20 seconds just to look for some crazy tactical resources. And I would advance, I would move. And even if you're 14, 1500, if I asked you explicitly to look for resources in this in that position, even if you were visualizing that in your head, there would be a high probability that you would have seen queen f4. It's a pretty simple position. There's not a lot of pieces left, right? And, and it's a good thing to do when you're playing longer games. You're about to abandon the line, which if it works, would have been really good for you, right? That's because the stakes are high. If this works for black, we've won a central pawn and that's pretty damn important. So don't give up on it too quickly. Don't give up on lines that could benefit you if they work. Try your best to be resilient and take an additional 20, 30 seconds before abandoning the line for good. Well, the 15 second rule is like, take 15 seconds in the position where you're about to abandon the line to, and, and allow yourself to look for crazy resources. Look at the position with a different pair of eyes. And one way to do that is to say, I'm assuming, sorry, I'm assuming that I have to move the knight. Do I actually have to move the knight? Right, you gotta ask yourself these questions to bring out the creative side. Creativity is all about reframing the process of finding a move in terms of you know, understanding the position differently. Creativity comes when you tell yourself, ah, I don't have to move my knight. I've been assuming that all along, but I don't have to do it. And so then you tell yourself that queen f4 is far likelier. Okay. So of course, if the queen were defended, he would be able to play h6, g6. That's the whole point. So queen f4, queen f4, knight f4, and black is two pawns up. Why we can't allow the bishop to take? Because, okay, so let's say knight f4, right? 
Bishop takes h7, king takes h7, and the queen is lost. This is a classic discovered attack, and we need the queen. And, and this doesn't work because the rook just takes the knight. Can you look at knight takes d4 before bishop takes d2? Sure. So we have a question about this move. Yeah, but prime suspect, the point is white takes here first, not queen a4. Ah, oh, I see what you're saying. You say, you're saying we have this move, and you're absolutely right. Look at that. That's phenomenal tactical vision by Prime Suspect 50. You absolutely deserve a sub. Let me gift you a sub. I'm gifting you a sub. That's a great instance of tactical recognition, comparison, understanding how the position has changed. I didn't see that. Takes, takes. Queen A4 check and Knight to C6, defending the bishop with the queen. And I think that would have been the best move. I could have taken the pawn. Because if bishop takes b4, who can tell me, do we take on b4 or do we take this knight first? What should we do? Are, are both possible? We have to play knight f3 first, of course. We don't want to do this. This time, this wins the queen. Even though you have knight c6, it doesn't help because of the pin. Okay. So knight f3 first, then queen takes b4, and we're up two pawns. Good job. Again, that was awesome. I'm really happy to see that kind of stuff. Okay. So queen f4, queen c2. You hit the queen first. Um, queen e2, that's good. Knight e7. And yeah, we're just two pawns up and uh, and winning here. We're winning in this position, but we have some work left to do. So b4, he advances the pawn. He weakens the c3 square, so we occupy it with the rook. What if he takes back with the pawn instead of the queen? Wait, when? Oh, you're, you're still talking about this. Well, that doesn't help, right? Because our queen is, doesn't appear on d4. We just go queen takes b4, right? Uh, it, it only ruins his pawn structure. So back to the game. Queen takes d4, h5, queen f4, queen c2. Yeah, so rook c3 is very simple, right? Um, yeah, we should have taken... Yeah, so in hindsight, I would say a slightly more accurate move would have been to take his central pawn because he's essentially stuck, right? His bishop is stuck. And if he brings it back, we have this very nasty move. We can play rook ac8 now. It's just marginally better. I don't know. Oh, you're an fm. That's awesome, though. Still. OK, knight e7, eight, g3, queen g5, rook c3. And the rest is very simple, knight f5. I, I was worried about going here because of rook a1. And the pawn is hard to defend. That's why he's brought the pawn to b5. So knight f5 is right in time. He should have taken the knight and gone rook a1. That would have been the most resilient. But after rook c2, you know, we're still very much dominating. We're two pawns up and we're winning. Yeah, it's always the FM's nice. So knight takes g3 is very simple. And the game is over. Boom, boom. Four pawns up and now he gives the rook. But of course, even if he moved his king, we would have taken and either forced a queen trade or uh, checkmated him with a queen and the rook. Yes, they do. The FM's always see everything. Fide master. And the rest was... The rest was easy. Okay. Um, again, if, if rook g4, g6 takes, takes. He plays rook takes, g6 check. And this is already... It's winning for black if you go king h7, as Brandon indicated. But that move has to be spotted. This is actually still winning for black. But why would you play with fire like that, right? If you, if you take the rook, then white perpetuals after queen g6 and queen h6. To be cool. Yeah, exactly. But this is much simpler. Okay. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Any questions about this game? That was a very rich game. Lots of stuff happened. So don't be afraid to ask questions. I'm not holding anybody up. What about rook c2 when? A rook c2 here? No, but rook c2 instead of queen takes e5. Um... Oh, you mean rook d2? Yeah, rook d2 was fine. Rook d2 won the queen. Takes and king h8. Yeah, that was totally possible. Maybe even marginally better, but it didn't matter. You can find my shirt at the Charlotte Chess Center, but it's only for the employees. Thank you, Nemesign Productions. Oh, you're Steven Breckenridge? Oh, nice. Oh, can I? I hope I, yeah. Totally, yeah, 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 of course. Nice. Steven, welcome, welcome. No, you, it's public information. You can find my tournament. Um, nice, nice, Stephen. Good to see you. 
Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, but you can, I mean, people can, people can find that tournament and see who I played. I'm sorry if I didn't, I, I didn't, didn't do that deliberately though, I accidentally. Um, I didn't mean to, uh, to, to say your last name. I hope that's okay. Well, okay, but again, you guys can look up my tournament history and find the game in the 2007 National, so it's, it's kind of public information. Sorry about that, though. Um, I think he's okay with it. Okay, my apology. I really, I didn't, I just, it was just a, I automatically, automatically said set, set it. But yeah, Steven beat me in the 2007 Nationals. Um, see, Steven, if you were okay with me, I'll show, I'd show you the game, I'd show the game where you beat me. Are you okay with me showing the game where you beat me? Um, he beat me when I was 2100 and Steven was 1900. Um, and then I lost to a 1700 after that because I was so tilted. Yeah, so this was a perk by the way. This was a very nice game. This was a very nice game. This was in Sacramento. One of my worst tournaments. I lost two games, once to Steven and then another game to 1700. So this was a modern and basically we got this Benoni structure. Thank you, haircut. We got this Benoni structure. And the chess lords bless your router this week. And I went after his bishop. And this was, this was I think, a oh, underestimation of these central pawns. Because what happened here is Steven goes d5, and I'm like, oh my goodness. Because after e takes d5, rook a to d8, very nice move. Uh, pinning the knight, the pawn to the knight. I broke up his pawn structure, but now the knight lands on d4, and things get really hairy. Takes, takes, knight p5. But my pieces are sort of stuck in midair, while Steven's pieces are all centralized. He goes a6. If knight d4, then queen c5 forks all these pieces. This was a classical tournament, so I took here, but now the knight is horribly placed. Boom goes the dynamite, d3 and b5. Now the knight is excommunicated. d2 is a super nice move. If queen takes d5, then d takes c1. And who can spot the move here? I'm going through the game quickly. I don't really want to analyze it in too much detail, but black is a very pretty move here. I remember seeing this and I was like, damn it. Boom, queen a7, check. And he takes d5. And um, b4 is just a, this is just a very beautiful game. Bishop takes c3, queen d7. Now I'm a pawn down and I'm getting crushed. And the rest was very simple. Queen d3, I had to give up the exchange. Pieces flying all around. He trades queens. And the rest is a simple matter of technique. I made it a little bit difficult, but I never was able to uh, produce any real chances. That was a very nice game and uh, obviously super underrated. And after that, I, yeah, I lost a game to a 1700 the round after that. So that were my, those were my tournament chances. Well done, well done.